Hey. Good morning. Uh, my name is Supervisor Bruce McPherson. Uh, I'm going to be calling the May 25th, 2021 Board of Supervisors Santa Cruz County meeting to order. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we will have a moment of silence and then uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Oh, we said the Pledge of, of Allegiance, please join me. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we will go to item number three, consideration of late additions to the agenda, uh, additions and deletions to the consent and regular agendas. Are there any comments from anybody? I was thinking, yes, in terms of uh, late additions and corrections, um, we have a staff request that item number eight on the regular agenda, which is the syringe services program, that it be deleted from this agenda and we will bring it back on the uh, June 8th uh, agenda. On, okay. the con on the consent agenda, item number 21, uh, there's a correction. The item should read, Adopt resolutions confirming the previously established benefit assessment rates for county service areas CSA 4, Pajaro Dune, CSA 48, County Fire. Adopt resolutions setting a public hearing on June 8, 2021, on the proposed 2021 22 service charge reports for CSAs 4 and 48, and take related actions as recommended by the Director of General Services. That concludes corrections to the agenda. Okay, um, I you know I don't know where uh, this might be uh, mentioned. I think this is as good as anything. But we had an historic announcement that uh, Supervisor's friend and Cap had uh, participated in, and the Pajaro River levy. This has been a uh, this is a landmark announcement, and I just want to congratulate both of you for your efforts that you have done, and Congressman uh, Panetta, and everybody else on the staff, Mr. Strudley, and others. Who have done this? I mean, this this has been decades in the making, and I don't know if the, I think this is the right place if we're going to mention it at all. But uh, congratulations! I don't know if either of you would like to say something about it. I think it's worthy of uh, a comment or two. Mr. Uh, Friend, oh. well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for those comments. I appreciated that uh, Mr. Palacios also was able to attend the signing of the design. Uh, agreement yesterday. And to your point, it's true. Uh, this was a project that was built in the 40s, deemed inadequate in the 50s, and failed in the 50s, reauthorized in the 60s, and has been sitting in a purgatory for the last nearly 70 years. And um, it, to many people, it's just felt like we've been pushing a ball up a hill. But now that we've reached that top of that hill, we're now climbing an additional ladder. But I feel like each step is a step of progress for us. We have funding now, we have state pretty strong state participation. We have obviously a very strong local and regional participation, uh, but this agreement which commits the federal government into a, um, a shared services here on, on a percentage of, of over 60, about 65%, we're working with the state on as much of the 35% as possible. It really is a pretty significant, um, not just a significant milestone, but a lot of effort. We've got a long way to go. It's a $400 million project, but now we are within that mix and for decades we weren't even considered in that mix and and so we're moving toward a construction phase where before we were always just in an administrative phase with the federal government I, I appreciate your comments on that it's 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 a remarkable achievement it's we, there's been more movement on this project in the last three than in the previous 70 and i think that that uh from this point on at least people will be seeing uh thing movement toward construction thank you mr chair thank you for all your efforts uh supervisor caput you want to make some brief comments too please well, Zach uh, pretty much uh, uh, summed it up there, and uh, uh, thanks, uh, Bruce, for uh, recognizing the work everybody's been doing on this. 
Uh, it's uh, it's protection uh, against a 100-year flood uh, uh, storm uh, that uh, would basically uh, free the people up in uh, in the uh, floodplain here in South County. They would not have to pay flood protection, which is costing them about two thousand dollars every year. Um, if they have a mortgage on their home, they're required to have uh, that flood protection. And uh, it looks like uh, we're going to go to some kind of an election uh, early next year for people in the floodplain. That includes farmers, uh, commercial businesses, and residential property. And um, our share would be about approximately $40 million out of the $400 million that Zach mentioned. So uh, that we, we have a ways to go, but we're, we're on the right road. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, I know our CEO, Palacios, um, <laughs> in Watsonville, city manager, and now is the uh, CEO of the county. Uh, I don't know. You've, they've probably maybe said it all, but uh, congratulations to you, too, because you've had to live through this, too, for years. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, our board members, especially uh, Supervisor uh, Friend and Capet for their leadership on this issue, as well as um, our staff, uh, Mark Strudley and Matt uh, Machado. Um, it is truly um, a very, very dangerous situation in Watsonville. Those of us who lived through the 95 uh, floods and then in 97, there were also um, evacuations and floods on the uh, tributaries. It was a devastating thing to the, both the Pajaro community and the Watsonville community. Uh, sometimes we forget about that, but it is a very, very dangerous situation. And we're now on the path to correct it and to potentially save lots of lives and property. So congratulations to our board and our staff. And I'm very excited having lived through that 95 storm and that, and that devastating flood. Uh, I'm so happy that we're on the road to fix it. Thank you. Very good. And I know, I know Congressman Jay Panetta was a was, uh, very huge, a huge factor in getting this too. So I just thought it was worthy of special mention. It's been a long haul. And congratulations to everyone. Um, we will move to item number four, an announcement by a board member of items uh, to be removed from the consent or regular agendas. Uh, does anybody have any comments on that? Seeing none. We will move to uh, item number five for public comment. This is the time for any person to address the board once during the public comment to not exceed two minutes. Comments uh, must be directed to items on today's consent or closed agenda, uh, session agendas or yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or on a topic not on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. We'll take comments now for up to 30 minutes and if necessary, additional time for, we'll have additional time for public comments that will be allowed uh, after the last item on today's board uh, regular agenda. Do we have any public comments? Uh, Mr. Yes, Chair, Bell? we do have members of the public that would like to address the board. But before we start, I would like to say, ahora es el tiempo para la Junta Directiva recibir comentarios del público. Si gustaría dar su comentario en español, tenemos traductores disponibles para asistir. Call in user one. Your microphone is unmuted. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett recommending the just released book, The Truth About COVID-19, Exposing the Great Reset lockdowns, vaccine passports, and the new normal, why we must unite in a global movement for health and freedom. Dr. Joseph Mercola and Ronnie Cummins are co-authored, forward by Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. states the enemy is big tech, big data, big oil, big pharma, the medical cartel, the government totalitarian elements that are trying to oppress us, that are trying to rob us of our liberties, of our democracy, of our freedom of thought, of our freedom of expression, of our freedom of assembly, and all of the freedoms that give dignity to humanity. 
for example, this cabal used the lockdown to accelerate construction of their 5G network of satellites, antenna, biometric facial recognition, and track and trace infrastructure that they and their government and intelligence agency partners will use to mine and monetize our data for free, compel obedience to arbitrary dictates, and to suppress dissent. Their government industry collaboration will use this system to manage the rage when Americans finally wake up to the fact that this outlaw gang has stolen our democracy, our civil rights, our country and way of life while we huddled in orchestrated fear from a flu-like illness. The lockdown mask mandate needs to be Caller 8045, your microphone is unmuted. Oh, good morning. So I have, um, this is Ellie Black in Santa Cruz, and I have been watching since the rollout of the injections for the COVID-19 reports and doctors and websites and blogs and numerous groups from all over the world and watching the reports of adverse reactions, including sudden blood clots and death and otherwise healthy people and young people. And this is not a small number. This is, I have myself read tens of thousands and that's just scratching the surface. And I've begun to explore further into other countries and figuring out how to translate those blogs and doctor's reports. And this is not even counting the menstrual and reproductive reactions that are apparently being had by many people. Now, obviously, if you have a certain number of reports on the internet, because it is the internet, that you have 100,000 reports, take 50% of those, and those are just fake, take 50% of that, remainder, and those are people who are having a placebo or psychological reaction, or they are misinformed or it's something else, take half of that, and that is potentially something very, very serious. With these kind of numbers, I don't believe that we can risk not questioning what is going on. And I call on the county leaders to put an immediate pause on any type of COVID-19 injections for minors. This county is currently giving injections to minors 12 years of age and up. And as these adverse reaction reports are coming in, which can be checked on the VAERS website, that's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, uh, it's going to be on your shoulder. Carol, your microphone is available. Good morning. Um, I totally agree with what Ellie was just saying, and I just I, I'll continue what she was saying. It, it, you all need to halt immediately any injections of children ages 12 through 18. You need to be, it, it, it could, it, this could be potentially extremely hazardous to their health. And I just don't think you all are considering that. Um, and the other thing that's extremely concerning um, is what's happening in, in Sarah, Cla Sarah Santa Clara County. The health um, officer there issued an order that the businesses and governmental entities have to ascertain vaccination status, which we all know it's not a vaccine. Um, it doesn't meet the definition of a vaccine, but that's the word they're using. Um, of the personnel in that county, that's extremely concerning. Um, and I hope that we do not in our county even consider that because it violates numerous uh, laws already on the books. And I'll go ahead and just give you an example of some of the laws that that violates. Number one, um, Civil Code 51, which protects free and equal access to all public accommodations. Public accommodations are private businesses engaged in commerce. That means retail stores, banks, restaurants, 
schools, recreation, transportation, it's all public accommodation and you cannot discriminate against any member of the public for any reason whatsoever. And this is a long standing code. It's civil code 51. It's called the UNRU Act. It should be very familiar to all of you. Um, next, California Government Code 37100 prevents the creation, application, or enforcement of any law or policy that violates the California Constitution or the Constitution of the United States, okay? So the policy that's adopted in Santa Clara County goes directly against both of all these uh, well uh, understood documents, the California Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. Additionally, HSC 24171 and 24172 declare that individuals have the right to determine what is done to their own body. Uh, thank you. I, I'd just like to mention, too, that um, we've added a statement that Spanish translation is available, and we have an interpreter on standby. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Call in 2915. Your microphone is available. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, um, supervisors and um, clerk and board and, and participants. I support all of the testimonies that have been given to you thus far. And I'm also concerned about any possibility of Santa Cruz County imposing uh, requirements for an injection passport. I would like to um, bring to your attention the my concerns and many concerns of the public regarding the um, construction going on at 1500 Capitola Road. This is the mid-pen housing and uh, Dientes and low cost dental, uh, dental and medical clinics. This site is contaminated and there is no remediation plan that I have seen thus far. A recent report submitted on the GeoTracker state website provides the most recent results of the boring and analysis that has gone on there with both soil and groundwater. All groundwater samples taken were contaminated far beyond the safe, acceptable level for a PCE, a, a carcinogen. There are other carcinogens that have been found as a result of the most recent testing. The soils in that area are highly contaminated close to what is now the laundromat, but used to be the fairway dry cleaner. I'm concerned that there is no remediation plan for this site. It is abominable to me to expect low-cost housing and dental and medical clinics to be subjected to this site that will continually um, off-gas this very volatile and carcinogenic compound. The workers at the site have no idea what's going on. The foreman told a state regulator yesterday that it's the, the contaminant levels are very low. That's not true. They are exponentially high above the MCL for both residents. Sol O, your microphone is available. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, yeah, my name is Sol Ongoiba, and actually I'm really um, going to address it to Manu Koenig. Um, Manu, um, I'm, I'm being a resident of um, Sokel, and actually I want to just have this on record. Uh, my wife has ad abducted, you know, three of my children, and they've been in Poland for last year. It's been one year and two days, and I have tried to, um, you know, uh, follow, the, the, you know, the DA guidance on following on a civil case, um, you know, filing a LIHAG case, and um, you know that's, you know, was favorable for me in February, and the appeal happened in Poland, and however, you know, they're kind of, you know, moving it back to another. Uh, to another court so it's it's really clear corruption i'm really really irated right now um because the santa cruz super court you know gave me right to children uh, custody so my wife she's running and the challenge i have um i want my wife is well connected here um in santa cruz um and she she's part of a santa cruz women uh, network so i tried since last wednesday so tomorrow will be one week one week when i tried to have a police report on her or just to just say that, okay, I have a criminal case here. I haven't still be able to have a police report, just a report. 
And I'm really, really, really right now concerned that there is something going on. You know, as a citizen, you know, three children abducted for a year. I haven't been able to see my children. I'm not able to get a police report. And I have brought this to the congressman, um, Emmanuel, um, congressman rep, Jimmy Panetta, under Jimmy Panetta, um, Emmanuel, um, forget his name, Emmanuel, and he's aware of that. So this has been elevated. I'm really, really frustrated. I want this to go on record. I cannot obtain even just a simple police report. This is really, really frustrating. I feel like I'm being interested as a second class citizen. I don't know what's going on. So Manu, I need really your help. I'm elevating this uh, to also follow up with Emmanuel and Jimmy, whatever needs to be done. Just to get a simple report, I'm not able to get that. That's very frustrating. Sylvia A, your microphone is available. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My, my name is Sylvia Austerlick, and I am the alternate to the county at large representative on the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County Board of Directors. And I'm here to celebrate the Community Action Month of May. Community Action Board of Santa Cruz, known as CAB, has been fighting poverty and creating social change in Santa Cruz County for over 56 years now. And CAP Social Services supports over 11,000 people with low incomes each year. CAP's programming has four focus areas of community service, immigration, homelessness prevention and intervention, and employment. And we invite you to visit our website, Facebook, Instagram, and learn more about how our agency supports our community. And also on CAP's behalf, I want to thank Ryan Connerty for his service on the CAP board. And I know because I'm his alternate, so I'm twice as thankful. So um, thank you, everybody, for, for your time. And then, thank you. That concludes the speakers for public comment, Chair. Okay, uh, we will go to uh, item number six for action on the consent items uh, 11 through 36. Any board members have uh, comments on the consent agenda? I'll start with um, Supervisor Caput and we'll go reverse order on number uh, Supervisor number four district. Uh, do you have any comments on the consent agenda? Uh, thank you. No, I don't. Uh, everything's fine. Okay, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, no, Mr. Chair, no, no comments. Wow, okay, supervisor friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a brief comment on the Criminal Justice Council item and the renewal of the MOU and JPA. Um, I just appreciate the work of Ms. Coburn on this, especially uh, the Criminal Justice Council has been doing some pretty important work and to have our our county take the lead on the renewal of this and all the agencies expressing that interest. Just appreciate the work of Ms. Coburn and, and those that serve on the Criminal Justice Council as well for that. That's the only item. Thank you. Very good. Supervisor Koenig. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a few items to comment on. Uh, on item 19, to schedule a public hearing related to the issuance of uh, lease revenue bonds to finance the potential acquisition of real property located at 355 and 500 Westridge Drive. Uh, this is just a, a really exciting project. I'm really uh, happy to see it moving forward. I, I know we're going to hear more about it, um, but this is this is an opportunity for the county to uh, acquire the West Marine Building uh, in, in Watsonville, and it could potentially be a place of employment for another 340 county employees. Uh, could uh, will allow us to consolidate leases for the Human Services Department, the uh, Agricultural Commission, Child Support, Probation, as well as create a public services counter for a, a lot of different public uh, uh, county services. So uh, just a, a great project that I'm excited to see move forward and um, look forward to telling more folks about it. On item 24, uh, I just want to thank uh, you, Chair, uh, as well as Supervisor Coonerty for uh, putting this item on the agenda writing a letter to the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection um, uh, about the states, um, about their proposed state minimum fire regulations for 2021. Some of those proposals were, were pretty draconian as far as limiting people's ability to rebuild after fire if they uh, live on narrow roads or one-way roads in the county. Um, so I know I heard a lot from constituents about that issue and, I, and I'm glad to see that um, we're officially going to sub be submitting comment to the State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. Um, 
Then on item 30, uh, approving the agreement between the County of Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission for offsite mitigation plannings at Anna Jean Cummings Park. I want to thank the, par thank the Parks Director uh, and the RTC uh, for, for working on this. It's really a very exciting opportunity to take mitigation funds from the creation of the auxiliary lanes for the highway um, between 41st Avenue and SoCal Drive and make a historically large investment, over $600,000 uh, in environmental restoration at Anna Jean Cummings Park. Um, so, you know, I'm excited to approve the agreement today. Uh, I do want to provide some additional direction on this item to make sure that the exact location of those plantings uh, and the nature of the environmental restoration is, is done with full engagement of the public. Um, and so um, I would like to you know, ensure that there's a process to determine the final location of the plantings and other mitigation measures and that the process includes public input, additional scientific analysis, um, and that it's ultimately heard by the Parks Commission meeting at the next Parks Commission meeting. Okay, thank you very much. I have a few comments on uh, item number 21, uh, uh, CSA 48, and also there's CSA 4, Power of Dunes, but uh, I'd like to underscore the importance of CSA 48 uh, with the county fire increase uh, that was approved by uh, property owners in 2020. Uh, this is a critical ongoing investment in fire protection for unincorporated areas. Uh, and like uh, the Supervisor Koenig on the uh, number 24, the letter to the Board of Forestry, we have to make a strong pitch. And I thank you, Supervisor Koenig, for joining me in uh, writing this letter to the Board of Forestry. Uh, special thanks to our uh, the our Assistant Planning Director, Pia Levine, and David Reed, our analysts in the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience for their contributions to the overall input to the Board of Forestry. I cannot overstate the importance of maintaining a lo local decision-making uh, about compliance with these proposed regulations. Uh, my district in particular has many challenges that made uh, the strict compliance impossible. Um, and I, I, uh, Ms. Levine and uh, Mr. Reed were there a couple of weeks ago before the Board of Forestry and turned some heads and said, one size doesn't fit all in making these corrections or how we can improve access to uh, the rural areas of the county. So I, I thank them. Uh, we have to have reasonable options for making our rural communities fire safe as possible. So uh, thank you to them. And uh, I want to let the public know that we have been on top of this in, uh, in Santa Cruz County and presented already to the Board of Forestry. Um, also, uh, on number 35, the update on the storm damage repairs from 2016-17, uh, five years ago. I just want to take this opportunity again to thank our Public Works Department under Matt Machado uh, for their tremendous work in managing the repairs from these storms five years ago. This has been an extraordinary amount of work to manage and uh, the projects as well as funding, getting funding from state and federal agencies. Uh, understandably, these things take several years to get this far, and we are grateful for all the work that those in the Public Works Department have done and the leadership we have had uh, with our Public Works Department. And with that, I would entertain a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda with the additional direction mentioned by uh, Supervisor Koenig. Did you have another point? Right. Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna re, uh, restate that. So I'll move the consent agenda with additional direction on item 30 to establish a process that determines the final location of the planting areas and other mitigation measures at Energy and Cummings Park, including public input and scientific analysis. And to begin that process at the next Parks Commission meeting on June 7th with an agenda item that defines a public input plan for the project. Okay. I'll second. Second. Please call the roll. Thank you, Chair. During the vote, there is a member of the public that would still like to speak oh, to. Excuse me. Okay. okay. Thank you. Caller 1999, your microphone is available. Caller 1999. Okay, I guess I can be heard. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I appreciate that I'm able to speak. I was cut off earlier and then I thought I was on the queue. And I guess I still am. So I thank you. I'm going to do a stoic quote Be free of passion, but full of love. 
A mistake does not become, that's the end of the stoic quote, a mistake does not become an error unless one refuses to correct it. Um, my first comment is that as of yesterday and this morning, I wasn't able to access previous um, agendas. Um, my understanding is over 1,400 pages were rubber stamped last week. And now I can't access to see how much of that was actually on the consent agenda. Um, I did write something publicly yesterday at 7.56 a.m. on May 24th, and I republished it this morning on Facebook. My full name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, so that's public information. I don't have time to read it. I really want to thank the first four speakers. Um, they really said some really good information. And so what I wrote is public. I wonder how many people know what the word coctus, coctus, coctic means. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm not a translator, so uh, we'll move on to a vote. Is there anybody else who wants to comment on the um, consent agenda that we missed? Okay, uh, please call the roll on the cons consent agenda. Thank you. As a reminder, Supervisor Koenig motion to approve. Supervisor Friend second, and there's additional direction on item 30. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we will move to um, item number seven to consider a report on continuous process improvement initiative known as PRIMO and direct the County Administrative Office to return no later than November 16th, 2021, with the next update as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. Uh, I think Mr. Palacios might have brief comments and then a uh, presentation by Elisa Benson, our Deputy CEO. Yes, uh, Chair Mc McPherson and members of the board. Uh, this is one of the initiatives that we have started uh, when I um, became the County Administrative Officer almost four years ago. And it is really part of our continuing efforts to, um, to implement a common management uh, structure in the county uh, that emphasizes the need to continuously improve our services to the public. And so um, Assistant CAO Lisa Benson um, has been leading this effort and I'll turn it over to her and other county administrative staff at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning, uh, members of the board. As uh, everyone uh, heard, my name is Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO, and it's been my pleasure and honor to support the rollout of continuous process improvement here in the County of Santa Cruz. And our program is nicknamed PRIMO, Process Improvement Onward. And uh, it's kind of interesting to reflect that it was 15 months ago, February 25th, 2020, when we brought forward our one-year showcase to the board uh, to highlight what we had done in our first year of Primo, um, we did a, a we rolled out our um, highlights and our our project teams in our community room downstairs, and really had the opportunity to dig into that first year. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how do we revive and bring uh, the Primo program back into the light after a very challenging 15 months. We have about 30 minutes for our conversation today, including both public comment and Q&A from the board. I'm very pleased to uh, share the report today uh, with Rita and Eric, who are core team members and have been part of our program from the start. They'll be doing the majority of the presentation and then um, I won't be able to help myself, I'm sure, but piping in along the way. So we're excited to share what we've learned and our plans for moving forward. Take it away, Rita. Um, good morning, Chair and members of the board. As part of our agenda today, I will be providing some context for you and the public on the Continuous Process Improvement Initiative. I will also take some time to review where the Process Improvement Initiative, known as PRIMO, got started and where we left off. Finally, I'll be sharing some of our efforts to restart and re-engage with stakeholders. Um, and then after that, Eric Friedrich will be sharing our lessons learned from our re-engagement efforts, along with a framework for reviving Primo. So 
So a little bit on our process improvement initiative. Continuous process improvement is a workplace philosophy that sets improvement as part of everyday work. Processes are improved incrementally over time instead of radically at once. And this is done by engaging employees who work within the processes and empowering them to pursue process innovations. The most common approach to this workplace philosophy is through lean, and that's the approach that we been taking. Um, lean focuses on identifying and eliminating wastes within a process and only preserving process steps that add value to um, the customer from the customer's perspective. Um, a process can be anything from department submitting a request to personnel for recruitment um, to a member, member of the public um, coming in to request a permit or to pay a fee. So as such, customers can be um, an internal department or a member of the public. Um, Lean combines tools and strategies that empower employees to engage in process improvement work. And management leadership focuses on supporting these employees as they do the work. Um, additionally, Lean focuses on data-driven insights to inform new business practices. Uh, Lean isn't just tools and strategies, it's also a shift in work culture um, centered on addressing customer value and recognizing employees as the experts that do that work. And that's what we've been focusing on um, through Primo as a countywide program. We've been aiming to integrate continuous process improvement and lean into everyday work within the county. Okay, a little bit on the history. In Early 2018, the County Administrative Office put together a committee of departmental managers to begin thinking about continuous process improvement and what that means for us within the county. After, after a lot of foundational work, we began our outward engagement work with the county staff through engagement mixers, different levels of training, um, a um, process improvement portal, um, and we also engage with your board through several study sessions, uh, updates, and showcases focused on the development of Primo. In March 2019, an in-depth presentation was provided to your board, and it focused on the initial rollout of the program. And then shortly after, in February 2020, the Primo core team within the county's uh, CAO's office conducted a project showcase for the board. Um, it was a very successful event. It was an opportunity to engage with the project teams and learn more about the specific demonstration projects and the process improvement efforts that were made up to that point. Um, but unfortunately, shortly after, we were hit with the new priorities. The county uh, refocused on the pandemic, the fires and remote work. And while work on demonstration projects stopped, process improvement did not. We heard from project team members that they went back to some of the tools and strategies that they had previously learned to aid them in navigating um, this new environment. So after a very intense 2020, the Primo core team began to plan out how to revive Primo. Um, we wanted to do this based on where departments were as far as current priorities, new challenges, and current needs. Um, it was very clear to us that we couldn't just pick up the program where we left off in February 2020, and that wasn't our intent. Our intent was to re-engage with Primo stakeholders, um, to hear from them what of the Primo program pre-pandemic worked for them, what was useful, and what they wanted to see continue post-pandemic. Um, so the Primo core team reached out through various surveys, focus group sessions, project team interviews, um, and multiple one-on-one -on -one discussions that were very informative. So now I will hand it over to Mr. Friedrich to go over the lessons learned and provide you a framework of uh, Primo uh, going forward. Thanks, Rita. That was an excellent overview. Uh, I just tasked in this presentation to really talk about what some of the key takeaways were when we did our fact-finding mission over the spring, um, both uh, looking at where we were pre-pandemic as well as where we want to move forward sort of post-pandemic. And as Rita mentioned, we spent a lot of time this uh, winter and spring uh, collecting a lot of data from our, our, our Primo stakeholders. And we wanted to highlight here were some of our key takeaways uh, from a lot of that data from a lot of that data set that we were able to uh, collate together. 
Now, this list here isn't the all end all be all of everything that we've heard from our Primo stakeholders, but we think that these are sort of the top themes that we heard uh, throughout um, our, our engagement sessions uh, with our stakeholders. Uh, first being around uh, documentation and just really how it, um, the lack of standardization or consistency when how we're, we're documenting how improvements were put together uh, really, really hindered our first uh, generation uh, in the Primo program. And so we'll be looking in the future to, to move forward with a, a better way of systematically being able to document when improvements are made. The training curriculum was actually really well received. Um, we uh, spent uh, two cohorts uh, of, of folks going through a full Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt training. And while there were some critiques about how the applicability of that training and just the, the sheer amount of material, uh, so the, the vast majority of, of our stakeholders felt that our training curriculum was very well received. And so we want to build off of that win and that strength moving forward. We, we heard that more, more resources really need to be uh, uh, dedicated to a workplace culture, which is sort of Greek for saying we need to support our managers in helping establish uh, uh, workplaces that really cultivate innovation. And lastly, as Rita mentioned, while formal projects may have paused uh, at the start of the pandemic, many of the concepts and tools and techniques that, that we provided our, our stakeholders were used. Uh, we sort of coined the phrase here in the, in the CEO's office that it wasn't uh, primo through thriving, it was primo through surviving. We also wanted to take a moment and, and look back on our demonstration projects. They received a, um, a lot of limelight and a lot of resources. And coming out of the 2020 showcase, we really had a set of theses around how better to manage our, our demonstration projects and truly show lean in motion. And what was really interesting is that the past few months as we've been on this fact-finding mission, that's really, the data has really validated uh, a, lot of those, uh, a lot of those species and a lot of the, uh, the observations that we made coming out of the 2020 showcase. That includes the importance of project scoping. We've had several projects who maybe bit off a little bit more than they can chew. And so having providing more guidance around how to better scope a project also learning about you know project success is really the really the fulcrum for uh, for broader engagement into the Primo program, and that we can talk a lot about the theories around lean and the concepts, but when you see the actual tangible successes and the stories of our projects, that's what really drives broader engagement. Organizational readiness is key uh, when it comes to uh, performing projects. Uh, many times when we're in a project in Europe turning over rocks and looking at processes that may have been well-established for decades, um, it can lead to a little bit of tension. And so having the ability to uh, set the culture where we can navigate that tension in a productive manner and come up with better solutions um, is, is a really key component. And then finally, really supporting our project champions and their involvement in the project, helping them help their projects by knowing how to help navigate obstacles when they get in their way, how to uh, better coach and, and, and manage a portfolio of projects is something we're going to be looking forward to in the future. So speaking of the future, oh, we've come up with what we, we sort of deem a theme ecosystem. Now, where this differs from our sort of first generation in Primo is that in our first generation, we had a really wide uh, a set of pro program areas, but weren't necessarily very well vertically integrated. And so we want to take some more time to really establish the, inter the integrated and interrelatedness of each of these work areas. Starting with a foundation around engagement and using a, a library of resources that, that focus on lean that are broadly accessible. Then we want to pivot that towards a lean practitioner training that is more focused on county workforce and county processes, and that is more done in-house and using a more streamlined and simplified and again accessible uh, set of curriculums. We also know that we need to better support our supervisors, directors, and management when it comes to cultivating that innovative environment. And so we're looking to, to provide more consistent training and resources uh, to our managers. And finally, where the fun begins is around improvement projects. And that we want to really shift the way that we do our improvement project um, uh, support model into more of a sprint model based off of uh, other uh, initiatives we've had going on in the CAA office. So I'll go into each one of these quickly, uh, one by one. So starting with engagement and resource library. So we have a internet primo portal that we've used to post different resources and, and uh, different engagement events. Um, but it really needs to be built out. It was, when we looked at the data, it was uh, deemed to one of the least, more least successful aspects of the, of the initial part of the program. And so we wanted to spend some time and really revamp that entire tool. 
to be able to cultivate and collate different research and resources around lean to make it more broadly accessible uh, to our entire county workforce. What I really want to highlight for the board is really the second point, which is around a DIY documentation tool. Now, we feel like this is going to be the marquee deliverable uh, over the next six months as we develop a tool that allows us to document those early and quick wins that we, we consider sort of do-it-yourself uh, uh, improvement projects. And lastly, we want to um, continue to use, uh, use the Visa portal to drive um, our engagement through newsletters, showcases, and engagement. And where the integration comes into effect is that if we can put together a, a comprehensive and, and successful and, and simple documentation tool, we can then use the, the project successes from people's everyday work in order to drive the content for engagement and doing showcases. Again, showing uh, that, that process improvement works through actual tangible results. The other great thing about putting together a document tool is that we've heard throughout entire engagement of our project stakeholders that process improvement happens all the time in the county. And that's undoubtedly true, but we just don't have a really great way of capturing that and celebrating it. And additionally, when we make a change, we're not necessarily doing a great job at documenting that to checking to make sure that the change that we made are positive and are impactful uh, in the processes that are there attempting to, attempting to approve. So we want to use that as a tool to check to make sure that our work uh, is, is moving in a positive direction. Building off of that lean or resource library, we want to put together a tailored and simplified uh, county work training, uh, practitioner training around lean. The initial Greenbelt cohorts each went through about 64 hours of, of in-class training and that doesn't include the actual hours it took to work on the project off-site away from the training. It was quite onerous. What we want to be able to do is tailor a specific curriculum for our county workforce that achieves a few things. One has a direct, direct and simplified and focused set of tools for, e for evaluating wastes in our processes. And secondly, is wide, more widely accessible uh, to our county workforce. One thing, we, one phenomenon we found when we were doing our fact-finding mission was there seems to be uh, an aspect of, of primo haves and have-nots. And so we really want to focus on the accessibility aspect of putting together a, a training program so that a wide, wider swath of our, of our county workforce can participate uh, in, in a training session. We also heard that when we put on primo events, they sort of tend to be pop-up events and not really regularly scheduled. That's so we wanted to be more consistent in, our, in the, within the calendar year of putting together a, a training program that we know that every three months there's a new training opportunity to be involved in Primo. Now, the specific outcomes of this training is, is really key. What we want to be able to do is still use the learning by doing model in that the, the training will train towards doing a more complex do-it-yourself project, both individually and within a small team. And then the outcome of those of that training and of those DIY projects you can then go back into feeding our engagement platform. Now, additionally, we want to be able to show that these that the tools within that tools used in Lean work, right? So by by documenting the project and then by uh, showing that showing that the tools work, we can then further engagement. Which is to say, we want to really teach towards um, some really basic uh, lean lean tools around doing gimbal walks or process mapping, or around doing a five S exercise, or around a uh, root cause analysis tool like Fishbone diagrams or five Y exercises, and being able to teach to those so that they can um, fulfill their projects. But when it comes to managers, we also really need to expose them to the same tools so that everyone is speaking the same language. And within Lean, there are specific tools and, and strategies for managing in Lean environment, things like visual management systems and, por and project portfolio management that we want to be able to teach to, to really support our managers as they cultivate innovations within their prospective workforces. But the last thing we really want to uh, emphasize here on this stage is really emphasis on culture and coaching, and that we're really hoping that our management can take the tools that we teach to really help cultivate a, a environment in which we can question and ask why processes are done a certain way and then coach to be able to uh, think critically and solve particular problems. Okay, now this is where the fun begins. Uh, 
So as, as the, uh, the board may recall, we have uh, sponsored dozens of project, uh, uh, process improvement projects during our first phase uh, uh, of Primo. And what we have found as a project core team is that uh, managing, reporting, uh, and supporting uh, dozens of projects isn't necessarily the best way to go about it. But luckily, we've uh, found some other models of supporting projects that, that have worked really well. And I want to give uh, Sven Stafford of our office a, a shout out here. Uh, he runs our performance measurement uh, and initiative in our office. And what he's put together are a series of sprint, uh, uh, sprint model projects where a defined project has a specific amount of time, uh, 8 to 12 weeks, um, where they sprint through from beginning to end to create a solid deliverable uh, at, at the end of the project. And we want to emulate that. And so we, we were, we've been analyzing our, our capacity, and we think that we can support a single project each quarter for that's about a 10 to 12 week long sprint in which the CEO's office would partner with a prospective project team uh, in order to complete the project in a finite amount of time. We would use the, the lessons learned from our demonstration projects to know to carefully select and scope and focus resources on those specific projects and again be able to bring the full weight of the CEO's office and the res and outside resources to the full project with the uh, with the project team in order to complete, complete the project. And again, the outcome of this is around being able to celebrate the success and the story of that project in a finite amount of time so that each quarter we can bring an update to the board or bring an update uh, on our on our Primo portal to talk about the specific project going on with that sprint. So th this is an, an ambitious work plan, um, and we, we, we are looking to take this uh, one bite at a time. I know myself and Rita, we get into debates quite a bit about how best to put this together and, and if it's a little too ambitious or not. But we really want to start, uh, start slowly and build a sustainable model uh, of moving forward. So that really starts with that foundation of engagement and, and the resource library that I talked about earlier. That's really the first step uh, moving forward over here the next six months. Uh, getting that DIY project documentation tool dialed in, crafting it, piloting it, uh, making sure that it works, testing it, and being able to roll that out in a, in a manner that is widely uh, accessible to our county staff is really our first, our first point. Later in the summer and into the fall, we'll be uh, crafting our curriculum around our practitioner training and doing a initial test run and a piloting of that curriculum uh, with, a small, uh, with a small training session. And then by then, that should get us to about November, we'll report back to the board on the progress of those first two um, aspects of the initiative. As we get into the winter and into next year, uh, then we'll be dialing in our, our lean management training and support structure. And then lastly, being able to kick off our quarterly project sprint. So with that, I'll hand it to Elisa to bring us home. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rita. I really appreciate your focus over the spring on top of all the other stuff you're doing to get this restarted. I just wanted to draw some um, just high-level conclusions. I think everyone can look at that first year. It was really um, it was really around introducing the concepts of continuous process improvement and lean and, and prompting folks curiosity around the ideas. And then we, we went in a little big with our approach to the projects that, and their broad scopes. Um, but again, the idea there was to really get as broad in, engagement and awareness of this new program. As we move into our second real full year of the program, we want to start modifying our approach as described by Eric to something that's um, a more integrated, um, sustainable approach that really supports everyday improvement and, and that culture of learning and exploration um, of the work across the workforce. So we want to modify and, and go a little bit deeper, a little slower, um, and make sure we make uh, th this program something that we can build on over time. So uh, we're concluding our staff report and we just, as the recommendations are for you to consider this report and then direct us to come back no later than mid-November with an update on our implementation activities. We're happy to uh, engage with any of the offices around uh, this next set of implementation and design work and thoughts you may have. Um, and we really are, are looking to for, forward to hearing about your comments and questions today. Excuse me, Chair, your microphone is muted. 
I'd make a couple of comments before I think other board members would like to comment as well. Uh, thank you, uh, CAO Carlos Palacios, for bringing this program before us and proposing it in the first place so we can improve our services to the public of Santa Cruz County. Uh, and especially to Rita Sanchez and uh, Eric Friedrich uh, for leading this charge and for the many people, employees who have participated, they spent hours at this to make service to our county uh, residents uh, more pleasant and understandable and a, and a good, good process. It's, um, and one, one uh, phrase that was used that really rang my bell as a Cal Poly alum is that uh, Mr. Friedrich uh, used the, the phrase learn by doing and that's the motto of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So you're on the right track from the beginning, I can tell you that. Um, you know, early on and uh, during the many workshops and discussions that we had on this, uh, on continuous improvement within the county departments, we talked about numerous benefits of increasing uh, staff training and fostering innovation and meeting measurable goals. Um, and now we're talking about what we have learned so far and are candidly acknowledging that uh, there are many challenges to implement these programs. Um, this report is a refreshing recognition of that. Uh, that work um, is difficult and it's going to take time, but the rewards for all the county employees for how the community will be served will be uh, well worth the effort in the end. Uh, I really, again, want to thank the CAO and his staff, and it's particularly here, Ms. Benson, uh, Rita Sanchez, Eric Friedrich, um, Sven as well, uh, for, for the continuous work that you've had to move this process along. Uh, we like everything else that we've had in this last year. We, we really hit a bump on the road with the combination of COVID and fires, but uh, thank you for sticking with it. And uh, we're all gonna be very satisfied with uh, the results and the outcome and our the way we provide services to the general public in the end. So thank you very much. Um, I'll entertain uh, any comments from board members if they would like. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Supervisor Coonerty. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I just want to appreciate uh, the effort that's got into this. It's a critical piece to uh, empower um, every county worker to improve services and um, you know provide better outcomes for for anyone who's interacting with the county or for our workers, right? And the less time uh, spent doing unnecessary or repetitive tasks allows us to do other things that, that better serve the community. Um, I guess I'd make a couple comments. One is um, I think going through a pandemic, economic crisis and fire uh, is possibly the uh, biggest lean project uh, the county's ever run. Um, and there were a lot of lessons learned from that process and that response. And so um, I think, you know, it's sort of framed as we went on this pause while we dealt with these issues, but in fact, right, we were moving quickly, we were breaking through red tape, we were doing things we'd never done before and finding quick solutions uh, and empowering people to, to stand up warehouses and uh, evacuation centers and uh, allow people, restaurants to, to have people sit in parking lots, right? This, this is all continuous process improvement um, that we need to figure out how to translate into um, policies regularly, both the mindset and, and potentially uh, the approach and, and outcomes. And so, um, so one, I want to I want to encourage uh, that we go back and think about the lessons learned um, and treat it, you know, never waste a crisis and treat it as uh, as a learning opportunity. And the second part is, um, I look forward. I think uh, I would hope for the next uh, report on this to have um, you know the employees themselves up presenting what they do. It's hard, I think, for people outside the organization to, to understand the acronyms and the process. I think it's easy when they see an example of how this works and um, they can start applying it to their to their own work uh, or to their own processes. So um, so hopefully that'll be built in as we go forward to have um, to have to have some of these processes, you know, actual improvements highlighted at the next at the next reporting period. Well taken. Uh, anybody else would the supervisor friend? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I really appreciate Supervisor Coonerty's comments. I think that they were uh, spot on on the ways, the things that we were done last year and ways that we can expand upon them moving forward in a permanence. Um, I did have a question. I think maybe Mr. Friedrich, this was best for you. You'd presented on 
a section that was in the staff report in regards to the sprints, but in particular on the quarterly. I just want to make sure that I actually understand what's being presented because was, I was a little confused reading the agenda item. There's a, a line in there that says, quote, only one project would be conducted per quarter to focus resources, end quote. So I'm just saying, are, are we saying that there would be four total projects a year and that's the max that we'd be doing? I understand that there's other things that go on at the same time. Um, and I recognize the statement that we've been focusing on a lot of things, but I just want to make sure I get an understanding of what the expectation is. That number, for me, doesn't seem like that many. And so I just wanted to make sure that, that if that was per individual, was that per project team? Is it four total that the county is going to be focusing on a year? Just make sure that I get a complete understanding of that. Yeah, Supervisor Friend, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the question. And uh, that'd be correct. It'd be four total uh, from, the, uh, from the core team uh, uh, each year. Now, that is just something because we wanted to start small. As we understand our own capacity to manage these projects, that could increase to two per quarter or three per quarter. But at least for this next year, we want to at least just kind of focus kind of one at a time and make sure that we're dialing in our project delivery model uh, so that we're not biting off more than we can chew. If I can add one more um, element to that, uh, one of our, um, we, we still anticipate that our our department-based teams will be working on projects. So again, this is around cent a centralized support model versus stuff that may be going on, I don't want to say independently, but separately in departments. So again, this was around how do we help create sort of that base approach um, is it in a training approach that's a little bit more manageable? So it's again tighter scopes, uh, having a clear timeline. Uh, that ninety-day sprint um, really helps you uh, be clear about the specific things you're going to address and not um, take on more than what you can do. One of the challenges you find frequently with these types of projects is people do do it once. And they don't actually come back to circle back and uh, make it continuous. So we want to just really sort of boil down what are the mechanics of getting that first generation one project off the ground and giving, making sure they have the framework to then move forward and continue subsequent um, iterations of improvement. Okay. And I mean, so I think I have more understanding i'm still gonna ask a couple questions that's all right vincent i mean so because my concern is and by the way let, let's start with the with the ten thousand foot view that these concerns are are rooted in the fact of how how amazing this actually could be so for um, potential for both the public and, and the county as an organization and this is more about um it's not our job to get involved in the process down the weeds it's not a policymaker's um it's not really an appropriate role for us but I, we should still have an understanding of what it is that's being planned. And, and for me, um, I would be concerned that you would have a 90 day sprint. And then as you talk about it being continued for that department, at least continuing working on it, but it sounds like then it's sort of, it sounds like the doors closed on it. So, and it sounds like then there's just four within that year, which I'd recognize these could be four transformational projects. I mean, it's also the quality of it to be fair. But I think that if, if you are, if departments are still doing departmental level work, and I think that if those four projects have continued uh, improvement, then the, the way that this should get reported out to the community and the board should have that information. I mean, I think that, that you can have sort of a macro level four projects or one project per quarter, but then in the next quarter, we should learn what got updated in the project that was completed in the last quarter. And we should also be receiving on a, on a smaller basis what's happening at a department level. Otherwise, it doesn't seem as transformational as I think the intention is. And, and so it's more of, I guess, uh, uh, how it gets explained uh, moving forward. I mean, I'm comfortable and I completely understand, Mr. Friedrich, what you were saying about a first year analysis. And then I would hope then that there is the same process improvement being applied to the process improvement, uh, which is to say that I would anticipate that in the second year, we'd keep you to that and that you would say whether four is the right number, whether we can move to six or eight, because uh, otherwise, it just it, it feels like we're setting up uh, a standard that we know we can make as opposed to one that we're trying to reach. As Supervisor Coonerty and I, when we pushed for this some years back, really said, why don't we set some of these stretch goals and see where we can go? I'd much rather have us fail at trying to transform the process than, than just setting things that we know we can do. Um, I think that that's what's going to change it. So 
I appreciate having a better understanding. I think that we know where we both are on this. And I appreciate that, Ms. Benson, Mr. Friedrich. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Caput. Did you have a comment? You bet. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank, uh, I hope I got all the names right here now, Rita, Eric, and Lisa, and also uh, Carlos uh, Blasius for uh, putting all this together. I know it's been a lot of work. I'm just curious about uh, during this past year, how that affected how you were all able to get together and uh, do everything that uh, for this report. It would have this report would have been a lot different if we didn't have the pandemic, we didn't have the fire, we didn't have the economic turmoil that we did have. Uh, I, I'm just uh, it's uh, curious on, on how you adapted and uh, did the report. One of you can uh, respond if you want. I'd be happy to respond to that, Supervisor Caput. I, absolutely. I mean, the resources of the CAO staff team really had to pivot towards um, both pandemic and then after the pandemic CZU response. So we we were all sort of focused on the most immediate priorities um, and tried to stay in touch with our um, primo sort of front runners from the first year. And, and I think actually Ryan, Supervisor Coonerty spoke to it. What I saw when I was in the EOC during CO, um, CZU fire, there were a lot of folks who are green belts who were also deployed in the um, fire response who were utilizing concepts around mapping out new processes we had to design on the fly. They were they were using the concepts and the tools as we sort of solved the problems of the day. So as I reflect on where we were coming out of the showcase in February, which was we had a you know a really solid work plan that we wanted to move forward. Uh, with the existing Greenbelt projects, with new tools that sort of had to be set aside. I do not feel like the last year was a lost year for Primo. Um, it was actually a year where we had to draw on those concepts to just make it through the year. When we restarted in January, uh, like, like Rita and Eric said, we really wanted to um, make sure we were rooted in the real experience of our staff. One of the key concepts of Lean is that idea of going to the people who do the work and asking them what their experience is and how it's going. And so we, that's why we designed the, the surveys. But we also wanted to have those those face-to-face virtual face-to-face -face conversations. And one thing I'll say about the surveys themselves is, you know, we have lots of graphs and charts from those, but we also had some open-ended questions. And the time people took to reflect on their experience over the last year, the qualitative data we got in those surveys were incredibly informative about how people use the tools, but also that they wanted to come back to the program. They wanted to bring this forward and they wanted other employees to understand it because they did feel those tools and concepts were so helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coney. Yes, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to the project team, Ms. Benson, Ms. Sanchez, and Mr. Friedrich. Um, I, it's really exciting that the county is focusing on, um, you know, lean lean process improvement. I've worked for four different startups, um, and of course, the lean startup, the book, was was pretty much uh, our our uh, instruction manual on how to run a startup. Uh, and of course, the mantra in that book is build measure, learn. Uh, I think what I'm, what I'm seeing today is uh, a lot of great work on the build and learn part. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more on the measure part. Um, and so, you know, I think you also mentioned this in that um, you, you said process improvement happens all the time in the county and, and we just don't have a great way to capture that. And in my mind, the way that we capture that is with uh, some, some metrics for each department. So I, I might start by asking uh, the project team, does each department currently have a, a core set of you know, metrics or key performance indicators? For example, um, with personnel, do we know the average time, length of time it takes to hire a new employee? 
I would say it, it varies by department on how they're how they're measuring their overall work in terms of lean process um, and personnel. Yes, they actually that was a project they did. They wanted to reduce their days to hire, um, and. I think it's not just KPIs. When you're getting in at the process level, it's really understanding what is it that you're delivering, what the value proposition is about it, and then evaluating each of those process steps to, uh, to understand, are they actually contributing value along the way? Um, and what's the time factor that's being... Um, I mean, time is one of the biggest things that we need to be measuring. Our challenge right now is, again, as you mentioned, Supervisor Koenig, is having sort of a standard, simpler way, simplified way for people to go through that. Um, in some of my past experiences in bringing um, Lean into a government setting, that sort of touch time idea is, is challenging for people that you're actually looking at how long something sits on your desk, how, what's your actual time, your hands are on it and tracking that. So we're going to try and, you know, and it doesn't have to be perfect. I think that's the other thing. We are not looking for super tight precision that sort of um, rule of thumb works initially. So we want to sort of promote, we, this is not, this is not rocket science. We, we want to sort of get a good flavor and the idea is getting the right direction, that you're seeing something going the right direction and, and the measurement is relative. So we're absolutely on point with what you're describing. We know that sort of that measurement piece um, is really where we need to focus in the next year. I think the work that's already been going on with results-based account, um, accountability and you know the sort of cornerstone of our performance measurement program is helping us as a larger organization get more comfortable with that kind of idea of, of, of quantitative measurement. Um, but yeah, this it's gonna we've got to keep it simple um, and keep it relevant and just get people comfortable. Yeah, I think that you're, you're absolutely hit it on the head. I mean, we shouldn't get so obsessed with the process improvement that we're talking forever about the, the process improvement, we, rather that we're focused on the outcome, uh, the, the tangible results for voters in terms of service that the county's providing. Um, right, I mean, and you mentioned time. I think that, again, that's great. I mean, for example, uh, it's been really hard for me to get information on um, you know, how our planning department is doing and how many days it takes to get a building permit on average or how many rounds of review are required to get a permit. So I, I think what would be most useful uh, for me in you know, subsequent reports on this would be to see what those uh, key metrics are for each department. And that way we can, um, you know, that, that provides a minimum framework for everyone in those departments as well to manage to those, to come up with new projects that said, hey, I know a way that we can get the time to hire down, or I know a way that we can get this, these permits issued faster, or um, et cetera. I think so that just, like you said, that, that helps keep people focused on you know, what elements of, of county services really matter. Um, so yeah, I would love to just see what see those core metrics from each department. I'd love for, I mean, it shouldn't be hard. Like you said, each department is sort of tracking them in their own way right now. Um, so I'd love to see just department heads say, okay, yep, here are the things that we think are the most important for service in our department. Here's basically where we can get that data relatively easily um, and consistently. Um, and, uh, and then to, you know, see those numbers at least once a quarter. And, and that way we can also track any Primo projects relative uh, to how they've actually moved those numbers. Good, okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any comments from the public? We do. Y un recordatorio, si gustaría hacer sus comentarios en español, tenemos servicios de traducción disponibles. Just a reminder that we do have Spanish translation services available. Caller 2915, your microphone is unmuted. Hello, this is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. As a member of the public, I feel like I have heard a foreign language. <laughs> and um, I realize I do not work in the corporate field, so I'm not privy to a lot of these buzzwords and ways of describing things. And I think you will find that it's true of many of the members of the public and even members of your own staff. So I really like the idea of keeping this simple. 
What I would like as a member of the public is an example of one of these DIY projects. It seems like it's become very cumbersome to make a change. Um, and, and I found myself thinking, gee, don't bosses and employees just talk and work it out in staff meetings or something? It seems like now they have to go through a, a 16 hour primo training to, to get something done and and I even heard earlier in the presentation it was 64 hours of training maybe that was the lean um leader training I don't know but what I as a member of the public want to know is what are some of these projects and how do they come about and what is the opportunity for the public to give our ideas too we we interface with the the government um Local government is a public service agency, so why not involve members of the public that may also have good ideas? Um, I have heard county employees stand up before the Board of Supervisors and declare that the whole primo thing is a complete waste of time. Everybody's on furlough now. They don't have time. So I would like some um, explanation of what are the projects and how are they really helping the public and the employees? Calling user one, your microphone is available. Uh, hello, I. This is Marilyn Garrett, and I also um, um, applaud Becky Steinbrenner's comments. And I feel like um, your your feel good words are belied by reality. I feel like I'm listening to double speak while this last year with unwarranted uh, lockdowns and emergency draconian powers and the CAO uh, laying off county employees with uh, parks, libraries, schools, community buildings and activities closed. There's been a huge reduction in services. This is not improving services to the public of Santa Cruz, what is going on at all. And we are not customers. We are public citizens whose taxes fund the county and your salaries. This last year, and I'm quoting Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the introduction to the truth about uh, COVID-19. The suspension of due process, due notice, and comment rulemaking meant that none of the government prelates who ordained the quarantine had to first publicly calculate whether destroying the global economy, disrupting food and medical supplies, and throwing a billion humans into dire poverty and food insecurity would kill more people than it would save. Um, this, this sounds like a huge waste of money to me. And our Thank you, Chair. There are no other speakers to this item. Okay, we'll return to the board now to consider uh, the report and accept the report and direct the county administrative officer to return uh, no later than November 16th of this year, 2021, with the progress report on the efforts. Entertain a motion. Chair, Chair uh, I'll, um, I'll move that we consider the report, the first recommended action, uh, and I'd, I'd like to modify the second re recommended action to read uh, that the county administrative office uh, return no later than 629, so at our six, uh, end of June meeting with key performance indicators from each department, uh, a method to measure them, and then to report those KPIs and projects 
that affected them for all departments a minimum of once a quarter with the first full review to, uh, at the end of Q3, so at the R928 meeting. Okay, uh, I just want to make sure that's uh, doable. I don't want to say I want to make it easy, but uh, we're talking about the end of June. Mission, uh, is that a realistic um, dateline? And I appreciate your the uh, rec the uh, the proposal, uh, Supervisor Koenig, but I just want to make sure that's doable. We've got the budget situation coming up and so forth. What do you think? Can we make that date or would work? I guess I, I have some comments on that and I'd, I'd be um, curious about Carlos's perspective as well. So our, the Primo stuff is really focused at a, um, a micro process level as opposed to a departmental macro process level. So what we're starting to talk about is what I would say it's more related to the overall performance measurement initiative, where we're sort of going pro program by program, looking, utilizing the results-based accountability framework. So introducing the concept of KPIs sort of puts a new perspective in, in between those two, um, those two concepts that are already in in development and in, in implementation. So I don't know that given we have the budget um, in the next month, sort of asking departments to develop KPIs unless they already have them existing would be something we could pull off in this fr in this time frame. But I'm just also speaking from the primo stuff where it's a little bit more micro versus departmental KPIs. So I guess I want to make sure um, Carlos also has an opportunity to sort of reflect on that. I would want to be able to talk with Sven and the performance measurement team around that um, that nexus with KPIs and whether we think that's something that that could work. But I'm concerned about the time frame. I, I don't know. I, to me, it seems like we could move. Um, we have the June, and then we're pretty much uh, off and waiting uh, in July. Maybe the end of August would be a more reasonable date if we I, if we wanted to move it up. Uh, I just want to get some timeline perspective of what you think, uh, Mr. Palacios? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Supervisor Koenig, if it would be acceptable to um, report back at the second meeting in August, that would give us the time to get through the budget. And also, um, we need to coordinate the performance measurement initiative, as um, Lisa uh, mentioned, uh, with this program. So if that's acceptable, I think that would be uh, a better timeline for our departments. I know some departments already have a lot of these, but others are, are relatively new to it. Okay. Yeah, sure. The uh, the second meeting in August would be perfectly acceptable. Uh, and again, what I was proposing with that first um, um, that first portion there was really just to understand what the KPIs for the departments were uh, and where they expect to be able to get the data, and then actually have a report on you know where all those currently stand at the end of uh, the third quarter. Okay. Um, any other comments from board members? Um, just, just, just before I second it, just to, as a matter of, of clarification on the, the motion, Supervisor Koenig, there were a couple other uh, elements on on part two that I think actually kind of authorizes them to keep moving forward on this that I don't that I think were unintentionally left out of your uh, your changes. So I just want to confirm that you are uh, modifying the second uh, the second recommendation on the date and providing additional direction of what that is uh, so that that language still stays in. If that's correct, I'm happy to, to second the motion. Yes, that works. So should I try to rephrase this? Yeah, I, I apologize on, on just a process. No, no, I, I, wanted, I wanted to ensure that they, they still had the direction to keep moving forward. And also they, they proposed some modifications to the program today on moving to the quarterly that I think they intend to move forward on. And, and so I was just authorizing that as well. That, that's definitely acceptable to me. Okay. Um, does the clerk have, um, you know, the the recommended adjustment um, that uh, with the change of date? Is that understood? Yes, Chair. It is understood that it'll be returning the second meeting in August with the KPIs per department in a manner to measure with a minimum of one quarter. I didn't catch the remainder. 
Uh, right. So to return to later than uh, August 24th with key performance indicators from each department and a method to measure them. And then to report those KPIs and projects that affect them for all departments, uh, a minimum of once a quarter with the first full review at the end of quarter three, which would be our 928 meeting. And then I guess to incorporate what the existing uh, number two recommended action would be um, that also at the 928 meeting uh, would be a progress report on the efforts to resume Primo and redesign program components. Is that correct? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, Ms. Benson, does that, does that work for you or is that, did we just make this more confusing? I, well, I think um, we're, we're happy to report on our progress, you know, the end of September. It will be what it will be. I will say um, the adding of the KPIs expands the scope of the work between now and then. So we will definitely need to work with departments to understand that. Progress reports are progress reports. We will bring where we are. And and, and I think, you know, we're not, when we've talked about this probably over the last few times with Primo. We can't let um, perfect be the enemy of the good. A part of it is just getting stuff started and, you know, they may not be fully, um, fully conceived ideas at that point, but, but it's a place to start. I would suspect we would still come back in November with another update on where we are. Um, but yes, this is actually bringing, like we've mentioned, performance measurement and Primo sort of closer together. And so um, we will, we'll, we will make it happen. Thank you. I appreciate that can-do attitude. Uh, and as you said, build, build, measure, learn. The first build might not be perfect, uh, but right. we'll learn and do it again. Okay, so we've got an okay with the motion and the second. Is that all right? Okay. We'll call the roll, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, um, the uh, item number eight on the regular agenda has been postponed until June 8th meeting, which is going to be a full one, I think. Um, then we go to item number nine. Uh, it's a continued public hearing to consider the certification of the vote results for county service areas, uh, CSAs 3, APTA Seascape 13A, Flat number 18, White House Canyon, and number 28. Lamont Terrace and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CEO, Director of Public Works, Matt Machado. And we have a list of items about the certification and resolution of the votes. Uh, Mr. Machado, do you want to make a comment on this? Yeah, thank you, Chair and Supervisors. Uh, just a quick report on this item. So the item before you is to consider certification of votes of each of these CSA uh, ballot measures and also to consider adoption of assessments for each of the uh, CSAs. Uh, just a quick report, in February of this past year, your board approved the engineer's reports for each of these CSAs. And then uh, in mid-April, April 13th, your board uh, conducted a public hearing, which as you said, is continued to today. And uh, today I would like to report out very briefly the tabulation of the election results so for CSA number three, which is the Aptos Seascape area, uh, the proposed assessment did not pass with a about approximately 59% saying no to the assessment. Uh, for CSA number 13A, the proposed assessment did pass with a 75% of the ballot saying yes. CSA number 18 uh, passed with a 55% saying yes. And then for CSA number 28, uh, it passed with a about a 65% per, uh, saying yes to the proposed assessment. And so with that information, we do have uh, three recommended actions. Uh, the first one is to accept certification of the vote results for CSAs number three, number 13A, number 18, and number 28. Uh, secondly, to adopt resolutions authorizing and levying an assessment for road maintenance and operations within CSA numbers 13A, 18, and 28 for the 21-22 fiscal year and each year following. And finally, to adopt a resolution confirming previously established benefit assessment for road median maintenance 
street utility facilities and beach access maintenance, patrol and litter control services for the beach area below Via Palo Alto and extending south to the resort, all within CSA number three for the 21-22 fiscal year and each year following. And with that, I can answer any questions that you may have. And then clearly that um, these just take a majority vote to pass, is that correct? That is correct. These are majority vote uh, of the ballots received. That's correct. Okay. Any comments from board members? Um, I see none. Any comments from the public? I have one speaker to this item. User one, your microphone is available. A uh, couple of things. I'm curious what the total number of votes were. 55% is close. Um, and the other thing is item eight. I know you're continuing it, but whenever there's an item on the agenda that's printed, you are to legally take comments on it. And I didn't hear you do that. And so I'm going to ask a question here about the syringe services. Given the massive number of injections of COVID shots, what is happening to all of these syringes? How are they being disposed of? Because lots of, from what I'm reading, toxic chemicals in this and huge increase in plastic contamination, whatever these. So that, I'm just requesting that that be included in this program because that seems to me a large uh, larger use of syringes, if I'm understanding this correctly, than what would be uh, street use. Uh, that's my uh, input that I'd like included for item eight when it comes back. I think you said June 8th. Thank you. It's June, it's June 8th, but I'm going to stick with uh, item number nine and then we'll go back to the discussion on number eight uh, if we need to discuss that at all. Um, do, um, do, do you have the vote count or you have the percentages? Why don't you just give the, uh, the vote count on each of those, please? Sure. Thank you, uh, Chairman. So for CSA number 18, uh, we received 22 votes. Uh, 12 were yeses, 10 were noes. That was to the nearly 55% yes. Uh, for, for CSA number 28, we received 49 total votes. 32 were yeses, 17 were noes for about a 65% yes. Uh, for CSA 13A, we received 12 ballots. Uh, nine were yeses, three were noes for a 75% uh, support yes. And then for the CSA number three, we received 721 votes with uh, 414 no and 307 yes for the failure of that one at about 59% no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the public? There are no other speakers from the public. Okay, um, entertain a motion um, or, or discussion from the board. Any further discussion or motion? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, also a reminder that these are weighted votes uh, based on um, a number of factors, but uh, so with that said, uh, I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by friend, second by Koenig. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Um, I think. I'll go return to uh, uh, or get advice from the county council on item number eight. Uh, do we do we have to mention or do, announce it at least? Or uh? no, supervisor. What Ms. Garrett said was inaccurate. That item was removed from the agenda, and therefore there's no discussion on it at all. Anybody who wanted to speak during public comment could have spoken uh, as to uh, the issue regarding item eight because it's within the jurisdiction of your board, uh, but we don't have a separate item on that today. 
Okay, very well. Okay, that completes our agenda, our uh, consent and regular agendas. We will now go into closed session to uh, item number 10, uh, conference with legal counsel on the threat to public service facilities regarding uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, I will entertain a motion. Or is there any reportable action? No, no reportable actions today. Okay. Um, okay, I will um, entertain a motion to adjourn into closed session. So moved. Koenig? Somebody? Sorry, right, well, I, I mean, we don't normally do this, but I'll second. I don't know if we need a motion to go into closed session. I think that the, the item uh, yeah. is already. Yeah, I was right. just going to adjourn. Okay. All right, motion to adjourn. Okay. I'll, I'll support the motion to adjourn. Okay, very well. Um, please call the roll. I guess we don't really. Okay. Razor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Oops, aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Chair McPherson, your microphone is muted. Yeah, I, I as well. Thank you. It is uh, 11, uh, or excuse me, 1035. Uh, we'll just take a five minute break and return in five minutes to closed session. Okay, please adjourn. Yeah. Yeah.